My name is Greg Shields, and with me on the line, I have David Davis here also, another uh, fellow Pluralsight author. David, uh, thanks for joining us today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Greg. So good morning, good afternoon, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. Uh, another opportunity here for us to kind of spend some time talking about just the state of the technology here as it relates to VMware and some of the VMware products that we're seeing out these days. Uh, great to see so many people that have uh, joined us here in this pre presentation, and we've got more people that are popping in all, uh, all the time here, so I'm really happy to see just the, the level of interest that's out there these days. And, and that, that actually makes a lot of sense. I mean, when you look at just the, the kinds of products that uh, VMware has released, the new generation of the flagship product and all the other products that we've seen over the last 12 months, and, and just the evolution of the entire portfolio that VMware has put together here is in, in a very short period of time. David Davis and I are here for the next hour or so to do a really informal discussion, really just to kind of talk about what we're seeing out in the industry these days, to talk about what we're seeing in the certification aspect of the VMware ecosystem, and also to answer the questions that you may have uh, as you uh, post them here in the chat window that exists somewhere on your screen. But uh, mainly what we're here to do without any kind of slides, without any kind of prepared content, without any kind of death by PowerPoint, the idea here is to, well, give you an opportunity to figure out exactly what the state of the tech is as it relates to VMware, as it relates to vSphere, and also your full learning and even potentially your certification process. Uh, as Lindsay mentioned, uh, I am, uh, my name is Greg Shields, and I am a, uh, an author evangelist here for Pluralsight. Uh, in that role, I spent a lot of time building courses and courseware for the Pluralsight catalog. I also spent some time evangelizing Pluralsight in general. So if you are a person, a, a learner that's out there looking for more information, uh, getting into that Pluralsight catalog is definitely a part of my responsibility. And if you're a potential author or a future author, getting you in as a potential creator of content is another job role that I'm responsible for generally can help out with doing. I'd like also to introduce David Davis, who is a partner over at Actual Tech Media and uh, who also is a longtime Pluralsight author here for our catalog. You can find David uh, at virtualizationsoftware.com as well as, uh, gosh, a whole lot of different other uh, outlets and different writing opportunities out there in the world these days. Pretty much if you've spent much time in the, in the ecosystem of VMware, you've probably heard the name David Davis. So with that, uh, David, I know, like I said, you and I have, we've got no prepared content here. I have no notes in front of me. We have one slide, the slide that they're looking at. And, and rather than going through any kind of formal content here, I, I think we should just kind of do a Q&A back and forth between us to kind of talk about what we're thinking of as it relates to the state of the tech. What do you think? Let's do it, Greg. So my first question to you, David, is uh, so let's talk about the state of the tech then. In, in, that last, uh, in that last 12 months or so, we've seen some, some fairly big evolutions there with the, the release of vSphere version 6. In your travels around uh, these, these parts and, and in your talking to all the people that are out there, what is, the, what is the feeling on the ground right now as it relates to that move from the version 5 generation to this new version 6 in terms of vSphere? Um, I think there's a lot of excitement around vSphere 6. Uh, you know, obviously, I, just like with any, you know, Windows Server upgrade, it, it takes time, you know, in production data centers for things to happen. But um, in general, you know, virtualization admins that I've talked to, you know, are very excited about what vSphere 6 offers, you know, a uh, massive number of, you know, uh, increased um, maximum configurations, you know, higher performance, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of good new features. And, you know, as we've been uh, watching and, and following, as we've been creating our courses, you know, the VMware certifications have also been, you know, evolving around, you know, the, the new vSphere 6 and then all the associated um, VMware products, you know, related to vSphere 6 because when they upgrade vSphere, vSphere, they don't just upgrade vSphere. Everything else, you know, for the most part gets upgraded as well. Uh, what about you, Greg? What's been your take on vSphere 6? It's interesting too, you know, after a series of generations of vSphere released products where we saw some successive revolutionary changes from whole number version to whole number version. It, what's interesting about this vSphere version 6, and very specifically with the, the core product there with vSphere, is how 
maybe how evolutionary this particular release is in, in comparison with some of the other ones. I mean, I can remember a time not that long ago when some pretty massively brain-exploding technologies were released, and we saw these new versions out. And these days, it feels like uh, more of a, a you know a fit and finish, kind of just polishing up what we see in some of these technologies. I, honestly, it's it's a great time to be to, to be learning the vSphere platform. It's a great time to even be certifying on the vSphere platform because. I, it seems like the hyper growth of the technology, again, specific to vSphere itself, we've kind of seen a deceleration of that hyper growth, and we're definitely starting to see ourselves move into the, the long tail of this as a, a hypervisor for use in our data centers today. Uh, it's the other ancillary technology, I think, where a lot of people are seeing more of the, the, the big changes going on. Have you, have you spent much time with some of the other ancillary technologies that fit, you know, that hook into a vSphere infrastructure, David? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've spent a lot of time with VMware vSAN. I created a course for Pluralsight, you know, on vSAN. Uh, spent a lot of time, you know, learning about, you know, hyperconvergence, you know, products, you know, such as vSAN. Um, and then, you know, I, in the past, I've I've done uh, courses around VMware Horizon, and you know, many of the other, you know, VMware products. Um, yeah, I, I think you're right. You know, as I've gone around and spoken at VMware user groups, you know, I still ask people in the audience, you know, raise your hand, you know, what percentage, you know, virtualized, you know, is your company? And I, I'm always surprised to see, you know, honestly, when there's quite a few people that say 80% or greater, but then there's also quite a few people who say we haven't started yet. You know, we, we haven't virtualized anything yet. That's why we're here. You know, we're here to learn. And then, you know, the majority of the people are, you know, kind of in the middle, somewhere between 20 and, and 80. Um, so, but I think you're right. I think, you know, the, the number of people who are, you know, 50% on up to 80% virtualized, um, it has, has, uh, grown tremendously. You know, the vSphere product line has, has matured tremendously. And now you're seeing, like you said, a lot of uptake in, you know, other products around, you know, the vSphere ecosystem, you know, hyperconvergence in my mind has been you know, kind of the hottest thing. Um, but end user, you know, computing as well, um, you know, you cloud computing, you know, VMware talks a lot about um, vCloud and, and their vCloud Air product. You know, I don't know what the, the real uptake is on that, but I think cloud in general, uh, you know, is, is still an exciting topic. Um, those virtualization admins who have been using vSphere now for many years, they're, they're looking to automate, you know, and orchestrate, you know, their common task, and they're looking for, you know, tools to help them do that, uh, the realize automation, the realize orchestrator, things like that. So, uh, like you said, it's an, it's an exciting time to be a vSphere admin. You know, I think I mentioned in one of the courses I put together uh, recently uh, for Bond VCP data center was that, you know, it was, it was a couple of generations ago when the notion of vMotion was just the exciting, most exciting thing coming or going. And these days we're like, ah, oh, it's another vMotion. But it's the, it's the monitoring and the mathematics that surround those technologies that we're seeing a lot of the, the changes these days and bringing those kinds of automation into an environment that, for a long time was was virtualized, but not really terribly automated. So being able to see some of these automation tools actually perform some really neat things. I mean, I, I just finished an, an auto deploy module for one of the courses here that even impressed me in, in how easy it is to implement and how remarkably simple it is to put together some pretty powerful automations. I, I should mention too, for those of you that are participating there uh, in the audience, you do have an ask a question box somewhere on your screen. If you've got a question for either David or I, please feel free to add it in there. We're Taking a look here at the list of questions that are coming in very slowly, uh, we'll, happy, we'll be happy to answer whichever ones that we, uh, we can here during the hour that we have together. In fact, David, um, Unesh here has a really quick question. Just wanting to know, is the VMware, is the vSphere 6 generation of certifications, are they ready? They are ready, yeah. Um, the exams have come out of beta, and um, the vSphere 6 certifications are are up on uh, VMware's you know, certification website. They have a roadmap there uh, for anyone interested in getting their, their uh, updated vSphere certification. Of course, it starts with uh, the VCA. If you don't have any VMware knowledge at all, that's the associate level. And then the VMware Certified Professional is what we typically think of when we think of you know, getting your VMware certification. It's the VCP. Today, it's the VCP6. And there's um, four different tracks, you know, four different VCPs available to anyone out there. And then they have advanced level certifications on top of that. So absolutely, the uh, certifications are available. And uh, Pluralsight's course series uh, covering those certifications is, is mostly there. It's, it's quickly growing up, though. 
Uh, there's a lot of content available already to watch. In fact, let, let's talk for a minute about the learner's experience as it relates to these vSphere products. One of the things that I've learned um, in, in producing some of these courses is that in, com in, in contrast previous generations, especially a couple of generations ago, is that the, the, the process or, or the, I guess the, the ability for a person to be able to simulate a, a real production vSphere environment with some pretty regular you know, off-the-shelf hardware is perhaps easier in this generation than has it been at any point in the past. Um, being able to create your own you know, multi-host, multi-hypervisor host environment, connecting that up to storage, connecting that up through networking, all of these different activities with, I mean, I'm, I'm recording these things on a single machine here. Like I have one computer that's running VMware Workstation, and pretty much most of the, the topics here are things that I can simulate in this environment. Uh, what's been your experience so far in being able to replicate a real production world uh, in the environment that you have in, in your own world? Yeah, I mean, like you said, it's it's easier now than it's really ever been before in the past. Um, it, it, when I created my courses, I used a, just a single computer, an iMac computer, and with thanks to you know a lot of memory and a lot of uh, high-speed flash, you can run actually a, a lot of virtual machines. Um, on a single system, and you know VMware's requirements, you know, have also increased over time, and the number of different virtual machines, you know, you need in some cases to to run some of the more advanced things you might want to do. But uh, to get started and learn VMware vSphere and get a certification, you know, you really don't need need much. You know, you need a, a single computer that can run um, something like VMware Workstation or VMware Fusion, and uh, a single VM that runs ESXi inside, and then uh, you know maybe another VM for VMware vCenter, and you can do um, I would say almost everything you need to uh, almost everything you need to do with just a couple VMs uh, to achieve you know a, a VCP certification. Uh, and then I should also mention you know besides doing it yourself on your own systems, you know VMware's hands-on labs uh, is free, it's online, and you can access a sandbox you know, vSphere environment that's already built. Of course, you don't get the ability to install it yourself, but, you know, if you want to work on a little bit more advanced environment that's already configured, and uh, it's a great way just to jump into vSphere and, you know, kind of prove your skills and see what, see what you can and can't do. And uh, it doesn't matter if you break it because when you're done, you just click close session and, and that whole virtual environment is gone and it didn't cost you a dime. So a, a lot of great options for anyone out there who really wants to learn a vSphere today. You know, Stephen has another question here that I think is relevant since we did kind of pitch the fact that uh, the version 5 to version 6 change was kind of, a, of an evolutionary change as opposed to a revolutionary change. And he asked the question, so, all right, well, you've, you've said that now. Well, tell me what the feature, what, what's different between version 6 and version 5? And I, I think it's worth, you know, David, spending a couple of minutes just talking about what we're seeing here in version 6. I mean, we've spent a lot of time with it over the last couple of months. Uh, digging very deeply into this new version. Uh, one of the things at least I'll start out with is that the the web client experience is finally to the point where you actually want to use this only thing. Uh, I don't know if you've experienced some of the experiences back in the previous version, the previous version 5 iterations, where the web client was a great idea, but I just kept finding myself going back to the fat client, the full client, for some of the tasks when the web client just wasn't performing very well. But uh, honestly, right out of the gate, to, to answer Stephen's question here, the, one of the best things I'm thinking of just initially as, wow, this web client experience is finally something I would want to use. David, I'm sure there's got to be some things there in 6 that have been what's been most important for you as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, you know, I think when I created my vSphere 5.5 course, uh, I, I talked a lot about you know, the, the warning message when you logged into the vSphere client for Windows that said, this is the last version that you're going to be able to use the vSphere client for Windows. You know, in the future, you have to use the web client. And, of course, they didn't actually go through with that because the web client, um, as, as you experienced and I experienced, was uh, kind of painful to use in many cases. It wasn't quite as user-friendly, and it was just slow uh, to do things. And I, I feel like now with version 6, the web client is, is kind of finally ready for prime time. It's, it's easy to use. It's fast. 
and um, they've, they've made a, a ton of improvements in it. So, you know, I hate to say that's a new feature, that the web client is, is fast and works, um, but, but that's a big part of vSphere 6. But there, of, course, of course, there are other, you know, new vSphere 6 features. Um, I mentioned the scalability, you know, the configuration maximums. Uh, you can have 128 virtual CPUs and 4 terabytes of RAM on a single VM. You know, do these crazy statistics that probably most companies, you know, will, will never uh, even get close to. But it's nice to know, you know, that you can scale up now to 64 nodes per cluster in, in these massive data centers. Um, there's some other new features like uh, emotion enhancements, you know, cross vCenter cloning and migration. I, I think one of the kind of cooler features that I like was um, the content library. That was something I wish they had of, you know, come out with a long time ago. Basically, it's a, a storage, special storage spot for um, all your virtual machine images and, and ISO files. So you can easily deploy new VMs, you know, from virtual machines that are stored in the content library or ISO images, you know, in the cont content library. Um, and then a big part of vSphere 6 also is uh, vVols or virtual volumes which uh, if you don't have a, a storage array that supports virtual vo volumes, doesn't really uh, affect you immediately. But for a lot of companies out there, um, the, the virtual volume uh, you know, upgrade process and, and the benefits and the differences you know, are going to be a big, big deal to them. Let's, let's talk about that virtual volumes feature because virtual volumes in, in, in the learner environment is one of the things that we really can't simulate because it requires there to be some of that extra code, that the, the intelligence that exists over on that storage array. Uh, what kind of uptake are you seeing in terms of this virtual volumes technology? I see a lot of parallels here with virtual volumes to some of the things that Microsoft is releasing with its own SMB3 sorts of stuff and uh, with how we're seeing some of this software or uh, software-defined storage bits evolving over in the Microsoft stack. But uh, what do you see in terms of uptake in, in terms of this virtual volumes technology here at this point in time? Yeah, I think you know a lot of admins are immediately they're wanting to learn about it. Of course, um, it's not something you just jump into and, and click a few uh, buttons and, and you upgrade to um, immediately. It's something to to seriously think about and you know talk to the storage team or storage admin. You know if if your company is large enough to have you know, one of those types of groups or one of those types of people and consider, you know, the impact and, and you know, the, the future of your storage, you know, that, that you have now. And do you want to upgrade to virtual volumes? Do you want to look at, you know, alternatives such as hyperconvergence? Um, but it, like at VMworld, virtual volumes, you know, was a really hot topic. Um, a friend of mine uh, did six sessions on virtual volumes, in fact, and they were all, you know, heavily attended. And there was tons of questions, you know, about virtual volumes. Um, in our courses, when we created, you know, training around virtual volumes, one of the challenges we had was we didn't have any way to simulate or demonstrate, you know, virtual volumes because you needed a hardware storage array that supported uh, virtual volumes in order to do so. Um, since we created that training uh, just in the last three or four weeks, actually, a friend of mine who works at EMC, um, he does tech marketing for VMware's VVNX, which is their virtual VNX, uh, and it's a virtual version of the hardware-based VNX that's used for training and demonstration. Uh, it's free to download, and it does now support virtual volumes. So that's the first like virtual training option. You know, I, I've heard of that's free for uh, trying out you know virtual volume in you know, home lab. I haven't tried it out myself yet, but that's something I'll be um, testing out in, in my vSphere virtual lab to learn more about virtual volumes. But that's kind of my take on, on virtual volumes. We've got another question in here uh, from, uh, from Samir, actually, uh, who's curious about uh, our impression of the, that Dell acquisition of, of EMC. You know, EMC holds a pretty large stake here in VMware. Have you got any thoughts there on this acquisition of EMC and how that might evolve what we think of as VMware? Uh, you know, of course, I guess my answer has to be, you know, time will tell uh, since I can't predict the future. Immediately when it happened, you know, at VMworld Europe, I know, um, you know, Michael Dell and uh, Pat Gelsinger, you know, VMware CEO, you know, they both said, 
Nothing's going to change for VMware. They said that multiple times. I got an email. In fact, my wife even got an email from Pat Gelsinger said nothing's going to change at VMware. Um, but, it, you know, in the future, you know, long term, who knows, there might be, you know, it, it might be renamed. You know, the, the D-Spear, uh, you know, the, the Dell uh, D-Spear, you know, client or something like that. I don't know. Who knows? Maybe they'll rena rename the whole thing. But, I mean, my take is I, I don't see a lot changing for VMware. VMware has been independent, you know, ever since VMware, uh, EMC, you know, purchased uh, most of VMware quite a few years ago. And I think that's been very successful for VMware, you know, them, them staying independent and working with many partners and many vendors and building this VMware ecosystem that I think has really made VMware, you know, as successful as they are. So I think they wouldn't be very smart to, to change any of that. Yeah, and I, I think I would agree with that entirely. VMware has such a strong brand presence at this point that too much evolution of, or too much change of, of product naming or, or even just really the, the portfolio of offerings that exist there as VMware would not necessarily be in Dell's best interest, I would think. You know, the acquisition here probably has more to do with who's the caretaker of these companies, more so than any major evolution, especially on the VMware side for what we would tend to see in terms of the product offering. On the EMC side, that's an area where I think we might see a, a little bit more shifting going on, some rebalancing, cause mainly because EMC and Dell have some, some, some different offerings that are actually redundant or at cross-purpose. So you know, I, I think uh, the, the EMC space is the one to watch here. Uh, the VMware space, probably less so, just simply because of the uniqueness of the offering that VMware provides. In fact, that, that actually takes us to kind of the, the whole state of well, is, is VMware a going concern? Do I need to certify on VMware? Is this something that would be great for me and my career? David, I think it's, it's worthwhile for us to talk just a bit about the actual learning and, and certification process as it relates to the VCP because there have been so many changes that have happened as we've moved from the VCP5 to the VCP6. Uh, talk, uh, talk with us a bit about what your impressions are with that move from VCP5 to VCP6. And are there any gotchas that you're aware of that people should be cautious about if they're thinking about certifying on this technology? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the, the, one of the first questions you asked there is, you know, should, uh, what about people's career, you know, should they be certifying in VMware at all? And I, so I guess I'll start with that. Um, I would say, you know, with VMware being, you know, the dominant hypervisor in, in most data centers, you know, around the world, uh, to me the answer is, is yes. You know, you should have VMware knowledge, and, but you should also try to, you know, elevate yourself to become kind of the, the infrastructure admin, you know, if you will. Um, I wrote a post for uh, trainsignal.com, which is now actually on pluralsight.com over four years ago, called Become an Infra Infrastructure Engineer Before It's Too Late. And I actually got a, a message yesterday on LinkedIn from someone who said, you know, I love your post. I know it's four years old, but it's still relevant to me, you know, even today. And, you know, so the post is, you know, to, to try to learn, you know, all the different silos because those silos, you know, of compute and storage and networking and virtualization and, you know, whatever else you might have, they're all, you know, in my mind, breaking down over time and, and becoming just kind of the, the data center layer or whatever you want to call it, whatever your company might call it, it might just be the infrastructure layer. Um, so, you know, to me, it's very important to learn VMware, but it's also important to have a good understanding of, you know, the other things that make up the data center, you know, uh, Cisco or networking, um, Windows, you know, Microsoft infrastructure, uh, servers and storage, you know, all these things are, are important. Um, with, and, and VMware, you know, you, kind of have to bring all that knowledge together in my mind. Uh, most vSphere admins aren't, don't just do, you know, VMware and, and that's all. They have a good understanding of, of the rest of the aspects, you know, and in, in infrastructure in the data center. Um, when it comes to VMware certification specifically, like the vSphere, you know, moving from vSphere uh, or VCP5 to VCP6, um, I haven't heard of specifically any, uh, any gotchas uh, you know, of course, you always want to learn the new features. I always encourage people to get, you know, hands-on experience with uh, vSphere. You know, it's, it shouldn't just be a paper certification. In fact, VMware requires that you, if you have no VMware certification, that you uh, must take a VMware education course either online or in a classroom just to get a VCP certification, you know, at all. 
um, for, for those out there who aren't, um, you know, don't have the resources to take that education course and don't have VMware knowledge, I always recommend the VMware Certified Associate, which is the introductory, kind of like the Microsoft uh, MCP. Uh, it's just a basic uh, certification that tests your knowledge about VMware's product line, and you can take that online for about $100 and, and get a basic you know, level VMware certification. And um, you know, maybe at some point later, your company or your boss might approve you to go and take that VMware education course you know, to get the VCP. But if you have a VCP5 already and you want to upgrade to a VCP6, you don't have to take a new course, and um, you just have to take VMware's, you know, essentially their Delta exam or their upgrade exam. Um, what am I missing, Greg? I think one of the biggest changes, too, this, in this new version 6 roadmap has to do with the separation of the specific technology-oriented course, or I should say exam, from the foundations exam. Well, one of the things that VMware has done this time in order to just, it, it seems like it makes things harder, but in a way, in the long term, I think it's going to make things a little easier for people, is in separating out the foundations content into its own individual exam that you would take first, and then follow on with the subsequent exam that has to do with the, the specifics having to do with that particular silo for the VCP uh, data center versus cloud versus um, NSX versus uh, desktop and mobility and horizon suite. So uh, if you are planning on going down the certification path, this separation means that at first, you're going to have to know the foundations of how ESX and vSphere work. That's the whole foundations exam. And then once you've done that, it's a little bit less easy to see in the data center silo, just simply because the data center exam and the foundations exam kind of cover some of the same things. But as you spread to the other silos, like, um, like desktop and mobility, for example, with Horizon, you'll see that the Horizon components, just the Horizon components themselves, are into their own exam, which means that when you sit that second exam, you're not going to have to worry about how you configure network cards and how you configure connections to storage. For that second exam, you're only focusing on the bits that have to do with Horizon itself. And again, while, while at first blush, I think for a lot of people, that seems like an extra effort and a lot of extra work, I think honestly what it does is it actually makes the process of, of certifying a little bit easier, especially if you decide to go more broad, perhaps simple different exams and multiple different certifications. Uh, it, that's kind of what I'm thinking as I look there at that roadmap, David. I know we're still waiting on the, the second and third tier exams to come out. Those are I haven't heard any kind of detail on when those are coming out, have you? No, no, I haven't. But yeah, that is uh, the biggest change to me uh, with the VCP, and that was what I was missing. Thank you. Uh, is that foundations exam separating the VCP into two separate exams and? Um, I, I really look forward to you know seeing the the more advanced you know courses. They've changed the VCAP, uh, which I have a VCAP DCA is now called a VCIX, a VMware Certified Implement Implementation Engineer. Um, and then of course they have the top tier you know VCDX, VMware Certified Design Expert, on top of that. But you know very few people. In fact, uh, the number might even be as low as what hundreds, a few, a hundred or two hundred now, uh, you know, have achieved that, that top level. The mass, masses of VMware, you know, experts out there are, you know, VMware certified professionals or the VCP. So uh, when we created our courses at Pluralsight, uh, Greg and I, uh, I created the foundations series to help, you know, prepare for that foundational exam. Greg created the VCP 6 DCV course to help people achieve their, um, their specialization level exam in the traditional uh, VMware you know, Certified Professional uh, vSphere track. And um, so when you look at the, the courses you know, on the website, um, someone commented I saw on Twitter about our, our learning path. Um, we need to, I know we need to update our learning path with the new links to our, our latest courses. I'm, I'm sure that's something we'll get taken care of here uh, pretty quickly. But um, there is a, it is nice to watch the courses uh, in the right order. You know, start with the foundation series and then move through, you know, the specialization series. And we did create a, a particular order of those courses in order to follow VMware's uh, exam blueprints. In fact, identically down to the, the domain and the the bullet point, you know, level of each of the 
um, exam blueprints for the foundations and the DCV, you know, specialization. Uh, what was it like to do that, Greg? Well, uh, it was actually a pretty exciting experience because uh, you and I both had to do it twice when VMware quietly updated some of the objectives and tasks without letting anybody know. Uh, and, and, and again, this, this whole webinar here is not necessarily intended to be a commercial here on Pluralsight, but one of the things that was very different in what we did in terms of the learning experience was to create that very specific one-to-one -one mapping between or objectives and tasks all the way through to the things that we discussed. And, and the best part about that was not so much that it provided, I mean, it did provide an opportunity for people that were certifying to understand what test objectives are, but I think more so than, than any other course I've written for, for any other company, by following that very long list of objectives and tasks and forcing ourselves to talk about every single one of them created a much more comprehensive experience. There were things that uh, we were kind of forcing ourselves to talk about that in previous versions of this content, we may have inadvertently or in some cases purposely sort of skipped over. So the, the learning experience is quite a bit more complete here than I think, at least from my own perspective, than a lot of the courses that uh, I know that I've put together there in the past. So uh, for those of you that are following along here, uh, once again, we, there should be in your, uh, somewhere on your screen an Ask a Question box. We've got uh, just a couple of questions that have popped up in here, and uh, we're, welcome to, uh, we're willing to answer those uh, as long as we have time here in our presentation here today. Uh, David, we've got a, a question here from Satya that uh, talks a bit about SRM. Are you prepared to talk about uh, SRM today? I will do my best. What, is it a a broad level question, a high level question, or a very technical question? <laughs> Satya's question says uh, he'd like to be able to synchronize one ESXi server with another in the same data center. How can he do that? Is it site-to-site -site replication? Is it, is it SRM? Uh, what, what's the technology that one would use in order to synchronize one ESXi server with another? I can answer that question. Um, so SRM, there's a lot of confusion about it. SRM is a disaster recovery orchestration tool. Um, so what that means is it brings up the, the virtual machines in whatever order and grouping that you've designed and reconfigures their networking, um, and it executes the disaster recovery plan essentially as you've designed it. What SRM does not do, which most people assume that it would do, is move your virtual machines and your data from one server or one site or one storage array to another. Uh, SRM doesn't do any of that. And so uh, SRM relies on either an underlying uh, hardware array uh, that supports array-based replication, or it, uh, or it relies on uh, vSphere replication, which is software-based replication included in most editions of VMware vSphere. So you can, you can purchase SRM separately. You can use vSphere software-based replication and then individually replicate those virtual machines. So when they say synchronize you know, between the hosts, um, I would probably ask for a little bit of additional you know, clarification on that. But essentially, I, I would first suggest they look at vSphere replication, and uh, which I have, I have created training for Pluralsight on in the past. I don't re recall exactly which course it's in, but um, you can use vSphere replication to replicate individual virtual machines you know, from, from host to host. You could easily do that uh, on, in a local data center, or you could do it across a wide area network. Taking a look here through some of the other questions we see here. So I've got another question here from Laura, and Laura asks, uh, so we talked a bit about just some of the evolutions here in version 6. And David, you specifically talked about um, just some of the uh, I guess some of, the, some of the networking things that have improved over time is hyperconvergence specifically that you had discussed earlier. Uh, can you talk a bit about some of the new features, just some of the new functionality or even some of the existing functionality that does exist in vSphere from a networking perspective that can support that whole hyperconvergence scenario? Sure. So I guess just to clarify a couple terms first, um, you know, software-defined storage is, is running your software functions in, in, uh, in, in the compute layer, you know, across your servers. And so VMware calls their virtual SAN product um, software-defined storage. They don't like the term hyperconvergence. Um, what they apply hyperconvergence to is when you buy what they call VMware Evo, which is a, a, a dedicated appliance that has vSphere and it has vSAN, and they call that hyperconvergence. Uh, either way, um, you know, to, to do hyperconvergence, um, 
networking in many cases is, is sort of left out of the picture uh, in most hyperconvergent solutions. In, in fact, vSAN doesn't do, you know, it doesn't relate a lot to networking. You can use standard switches uh, in, v, in vSphere. You can use distributed switches if you have, you know, vSphere or Enterprise Plus, I believe it is, that has distributed switches. And, you know, take full advantage of, of those networking, you know, capabilities. Um, vSphere 6, you know, has, you know, enhancements to features like network I.O. control. So you can throttle, you know, your network traffic. You can create policies, you know, on a, on a per virtual machine basis and a per vSwitch basis. And you can create bandwidth reservations and, and guarantees, um, you know, on particular types of network traffic. You know, so that's something you can do. Um, Trying to think, you know, what else, what other uh, features they were, might be interested in related to hyperconvergence uh, and networking? Uh, if you have a follow-up question, you know, feel free to it's, feel free to ask. I think I'll okay, add to that. Uh, having played a bit uh, the NIOC, uh, I think I'll add to that. Uh, having played a bit with network I/O control uh, here in, in the course where that where that we're producing here. One of the tenets of, of hyperconvergence, as you just said, is the, the amalgamation of all those otherwise network cards into a smaller number of higher power network cards. And so when you've got two NICs instead of 10, you know, to use an extreme example, you have to take uh, some ex extra care there in ensuring that one kind of traffic doesn't end up impacting the performance of another kind of traffic. And so being able to have all those software-based concepts, constructs that exist there, uh, like NIOC, where I can control the different kinds of traffic on a traffic-by-traffic -traffic basis, is something that can protect you from that situation where, for example, your, your storage traffic consumes too much bandwidth from your production networking, or you're doing too many V-motions and your storage doesn't work. So, so taking a look at that NIOC technology, the, the, the feature that now exists in there, uh, is something that for some of us is not going to make any sense. It's not a technology that we may necessarily have need for. But when we start moving into that hyperconverged world where I have a much smaller number of network cards and I'm running VLANs across those cards, well, that, uh, that's a situation where being able to throttle those things with QoS is just a, is, is a great feature set, I think, for, for what people are attempting to do. Yeah, and network I/O control um, also becomes much more important. You know, when a lot of companies move from having you know multiple one gig Ethernet cards to say just a single uh, ten gig car or connection or or maybe redundant ten gig connections, where they just have a single network um, you know point of communication going in and out of the server. And yes, they have a lot more bandwidth, and in many cases, you know, it might not be a problem. Uh, it's it's kind of like money; it's not a problem as long as you have plenty of it. Um, with, with the network, you know, is, as long as you have a 10 gig connection, you, you might just be fine. But as you add more and more virtual machines that create a lot more, you know, traffic and maybe you apply software defined storage and vSAN on top, you've got all this network traffic going through a single connection. At some point, um, you're going to want to, you know, put on some reservations to ensure that your most critical traffic, for example, the vSAN traffic and the management traffic, uh, in your tier one applications, that those get you know priority over uh, people who are just you know downloading videos you know from YouTube or something like that. So yeah, that's what network I/O control you know can do for companies. Um, and then you can get into other things where you know you can do quality of service tagging, things that work with the the physical switches even um, to ensure that that traffic that comes out of the virtual machines. Uh, has uh, maintains that quality uh, that it needs, you know, as it traverses not just the virtual network but the physical network as well. I've got a great question here from Himesh because it's one that I, I wasn't actually prepared for, and that has to do with uh, the VMCA, the VMware Certificate Authority. Now, now, David, I know you've probably dealt with the VMCA in previous iterations, and it was kind of a challenge to do back in the 5.x version. But uh, to, to his question here, just was curious about how security is handled now in vSphere version 6 and specifically certificates. Honestly, in, in taking a look here at the VMCA and spending some time with it and really understanding how it works, the, the new, even though they are still sort of command line oriented interfaces here, being able to work with VMCA in version 6 is quite a bit more streamlined than what it was in previous versions. Um, in fact, even in my course, we even go through the the, the reconfiguration of the, the VMware Certificate Authority as a subordinate CA to an existing corporate PKI. 
And that process is, I think, just a couple of commands in order to accomplish that. So being able to, you know, create the, the request and then fulfill that request and then essentially reconfigure that VMCA as a subordinate is an activity that's gotten quite a bit easier. The, the process of re-delivering this and, and reprovisioning those certificates to all the individual components is now mostly automated as well. Uh, David, have you spent any time at VMCA? Yeah, yeah, through creating these courses, um, yeah, I did spend some time with the VCSA, or VC, VMCA, sorry. Um, yeah, and, and that's another new feature to me in vCenter 6 is uh, just the, the redesign of, of vCenter. Um, it's, it's, much, uh, it's, it's designed how it should have been designed <laughs> uh, quite a while back. I mean, some, some versions back, in my opinion. Um, so you have this new concept of the PSC, or the Platform Services Controller, and this new Platform Services Controller provides a lot of these services with the VMware Certificate Authority being one of those services. So, um, and the PSC also provides uh, SSO, you know, certification. So when vSphere 5.1 came out, there was a lot of problems with uh, VMware's uh, single sign-on, and they've worked out all those those problems with vSphere 5.5, and and then they've you know even done this new re-architecture, you know, of of vCenter and all these different you know features uh, with vSphere 6. So that's another reason, in my opinion, you know, it's a good time to upgrade and and look at vSphere is you know, this much more intelligent, much more efficient design, and, and a lot of, you know, new built-in features like the VMware Certificate Authority um, in this new platform services controller, you know, concept or, or architecture with vCenter 6. So uh, switching back here one more time, back to the certification topic, let's, let's answer one more question here for, for the guys here. I have one here from Balaji who uh, – He's asking about the whole certification process and very specifically that he is considering going down the path of certifying and he wants to know, uh, do we have any information about the, the expiry of the old version 5 certifications, the VCP, VCB version 5.5? 5. If he's planning on going down that path of certification, should he go down the 5.5 5 path or should he go down the 6 path? Now, I'm, I'm going to direct this first to you, David, because I'm unaware of when the actual date of expiration is for version 5.5. Do you happen to have that information handy? Um, or, or know it? <laughs> not off the top of my head. There is, if you just Google uh, VMware um, ex or VCP expiration, the top post is, is VMware recertification policy. And so it's the policy about, you know, when VCP certifications, you know, expire. Um, but to give you the exa exact answer, I have not heard the expiration date of the, you know, current VCPs. Um, I would, of course, always recommend if someone's starting new, you know, start with the latest and greatest. You know, you don't want to uh, get something that's going to expire, you know, anytime soon. So I would start with vSphere 6. And in fact, let's do one more question here because we have a great question here from Angela because uh, it has a lot to do with really what we're talking about here in terms of the learner experience when it comes to these VMware products. Uh, and then for that question, Angela asks, do we have any tips on creating a test lab? Now, David, I know you and I have had long talks about the creation of test labs and the, the variety of different ways to, to do that. I myself am a big fan of VMware Workstation because it's a these days is a fantastic solution for uh, being able to simulate pretty much just about everything in terms of what you need to know. Sometimes there are some extra tools that you may need to add on to accomplish that. Now, the, the, the biggest issue with using VMware Workstation is the requirement for horsepower there on the machine that you have your Workstation instance installed to. Uh, to give you, uh, by way of example, so the machine here that I, I am recording these Pluralsight courses on is a, a relatively powerful computer here. I believe it has six CPUs in it and 64 gigs of RAM. And uh, in building some of these courses, we pretty much butt up on that 64 gig limit from time to time just based off of the number of VMs that are running simultaneously. Now, you can back that down. I think I have three ESXi hosts running at 12 gigs apiece. So you can back that down to maybe just a pair of them at 8 gigs apiece and fit it into about 32 gigs of RAM. But uh, memory is definitely one of those resources that if you're going down this path, that uh, you're going to find yourself bumping up against unless you really you know, add a lot of that memory, that RAM memory there into the machine. 
The other thing that uh, is an absolute must if you plan on building your own test lab environment on a workstation equipment is making sure that you're running it on SSD and plenty of SSD because these virtual machines, obviously, as we all know, they consume a lot of, uh, a lot of space. So having SSDs in there is definitely another requirement, but that's, that's kind of my approach. I actually really like having a, a single machine here that I can run everything on and, and be able to access it pretty easily. Now, David, I know you and I have had some conversations, too, about some of the alternative approaches that people can use, and I know you've done some exploration with some of those perhaps non-local environments as well. Can you talk about those? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so you're lucky. You have 64 gigs. Uh, I have 32 gigs, so I have hit that memory uh, wall, you know, probably uh, maybe a little bit more often than you have. But still, I was able to create, you know, all my courses and really learn everything I, I felt that I need to learn within 32 gigs. Uh, also with, you know, PCIe Flash actually is, is what my storage is. Um, but as far as the non-local, you know, options, um, yes, uh, VMware's uh, hands-on labs, as I talked about a little bit earlier, uh, are a great, you know, great free option. Um, there are, uh, let's see, you know, Workstation and Fusion. Um, some people even purchase a server, a single server, and they run free ESXi on it, and then they run virtual machines, you know, nested ESXi virtual machines inside. So you can run ESXi inside of ESXi and, you know, create your own lab. So, I mean, if, if your company had, uh, you know, some, some lab environment, you can run multiple virtual machines inside a single, you know, ESXi host. Uh, there are some other, you know, online um, vSphere learning environments, you know, that you can, that you can look into um, besides VMware hands-on labs. But, you know, more and more if you have, um, you know, the, the resources to have a, a home lab that has, you know, at least 32 gigs and SSD flash, there's a, an amazing, you know, amount of things that you can accomplish with it. And there are also some third-party tools out there too. Uh, Angela mentions Ravello as, as an option as well. Have you played with Ravello much? Ravello, that was what was at the top of my mind, but I just couldn't remember the name. Um, yes, in fact, in my uh, vSphere 6 Foundations course, I did, have, I did have a demo of Ravello, and uh, the people at Ravello are, are super nice, and it's all about running um, you know, lab environments, and they actually run them inside either Amazon or Google Cloud. And it's very, you know, inexpensive. You know, pennies per minute, you can run, you know, a virtual lab environment. And so they have, you know, virtual lab environments, you know, already built. They have a catalog of images. And you can deploy these virtual lab environments in kind of like a blueprint almost. You can move the virtual machines around and then connect them, you know, however, you know, you would like to connect them. So, yeah, Ravello is an excellent uh, option. Uh, as well as VMware Hands-On Labs for online, you know, cloud-based uh, vSphere learning and, and training. So that's about all the time we have here today for this discussion here on the state of the technology as it relates to VMware. I, we had a number of different comments, a number of questions here in the interface of people asking, are you going to have this course? Are you going to have that course coming up? And in just about every case, uh, I'm happy to say that we are actively, aggressively looking for more courses in every, which, in every which technology as it relates to VMware and honestly all of IT and IT ops in general. So to answer all of your questions all at once, yes, we're doing the best we can and trying to get those courses and courseware out as fast as we possibly can. Uh, David, honestly, I thought this was a great hour. It was kind of fun to be able to do one of these webinars without having a big old PowerPoint slide deck to, uh, to uh, lock us into a particular conversation. I, I enjoyed myself. Hopefully, hopefully you did as well. Absolutely. Yeah, it was uh, an hour of fun that just flew by, Greg. I really appreciate you having me on today, and thanks everyone who joined us. Yep, thank you for, for your time. Thank you for the last hour. And with that, I will uh, send things back over to Lindsay for some closing thoughts. Lindsay? Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, everyone, for your participation and for joining us today. Um, if you have additional comments or feedback, please feel free to contact us. You can email us at webinars at pluralsite.com. You can continue the conversation online at Twitter. Um, remember to tweet about your experience today, and we will be choosing a winner um, for a free month of training with Pluralsight. Uh, just tag your comments with Pluralsight Live. Um, and again, remember as you leave today, please fill out our survey. Let us know what you thought about today's presentation. Um, send us your comments, and let us know what else you'd like us to present on. And have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Um.